Stan Jabalisco here, proprietor and operator of amateur radio station W1GV, Whiskey One Good Vibrations, uh, with a little bit of an idea for a variable frequency oscillator. Very simple variable frequency oscillator. Remember those things. Remember way back in the day, 1966 was when I was first licensed, and my call sign, by the way, was WA0. Pardon me, at that time it wasn't even WA, it was WN0. OKV, Ocean Kilo Victor, in Rochester, Minnesota. I was 12 years old, 1966. And my radio was a Halicrafters SX-130 receiver and a Johnson Viking Adventurer transmitter. Do you remember the Viking Adventurer? It was kind of an kind of a uh, an appropriate name, Viking, by the E. F. Johnson Company in Wasika, Minnesota, I believe, is where they were, about thirty miles west of my hometown. Viking, like the Minnesota Vikings, fifty watts was the maximum power that that thing could produce, and that was plate power input to a single vacuum tube. But as a novice. And the indicator of a novice was the N in the call sign, WN0OKV. I, had, I was limited to 75 watts. That was as much power as a novice was allowed to run to the plate input, DC plate input of the transmitter. And we had to use, of all things, crystal control. Meaning that our frequency had to be locked by means of a quartz crystal. And my first frequency was 7,185 kilo cycles. They called it kilo cycles for cycles per second back in those days. Today we'd more likely call it 7.185 megahertz. Now I believe in the phone part of the 40 meter band, but back then the CW part of the novice band went from 7150 to 7200 kilo cycles. Well, a year later in 1967, I got my general class license. And I was no longer required to use crystal control. I could use a variable frequency oscillator VFO and I was like a pig in mud. I was so happy. So I went out and shopped for VFOs to use with this Viking adventurer and I finally came up with one that was already assembled but actually it was sold as kits. It was made by a company called Night Kit. And I don't know the model number of that VFO, but if you go and Google on Night Kit VFO, I think you'll probably find it and see it. It was a, a thing about maybe 7 or 8 inches high by 6 or 7 inches deep by maybe 6 inches wide. It was gray and it had a nice dial on it. and It, it had four vacuum tubes in it and even the rectifier was a vacuum tube. It had a regulator tube. It had an oscillator tube, a buffer tube. So it had four vacuum tubes. I found a schematic diagram of that thing online, and you can too if you just go to Google on Nightkit VFO. And I was rather surprised to see the design that they used. But I'm going to reproduce that here. But instead of a vacuum tube, and instead of copying their circuit precisely as it was, I am going to use an N-channel JFET instead. I believe the one of the common JFETs is called the MPF-102. I believe that's uh, the, no the number of it. 
but anyway what you would what the thing had basically in order to get its to get its um, to, to get itself to work was a coil in series with a variable capacitor and then the thing was biased by means of a resistor something on the order of 10k I believe maybe it was a little more than that but we'll just for the sake of argument use 10k and that was the way that this thing determined its frequency it was a series resonant oscillator there, it was a pentode vacuum tube with the screen connected as normally it would be through a resistor to the positive power supply and the plate through a coil and transformer and such going to the positive power supply and that thing used 450 volts well we're not going to use anything like that here obviously I'd say about 12 volts would probably be sufficient for this thing. But what I uh, suggest, or what I would start out with in this um, application, is a simple blocking capacitor here, maybe about 0 0.001 microfarads to the output. which would go probably to a, a buffer amplifier, as that one did. And the thing would then go through maybe, uh, oh shucks. Let's just say for the sake of argument, 3300 ohm resistor to the plus 12 volts. Then as for the way that it would be keyed, we could just simply key it right in the right in the um, source line so source gate drain MPF 102 and then I would pick that uh, co that component this would be a 365 picofarad variable capacitor and this right here would be whatever inductance is required so roughly in the middle of this range or at about 180 picofarads you would get a frequency of 7 point oh just let's just say 7.035 megahertz that was the other crystal that I had besides 7.185 and I wondered what the heck is that going to be of any use to me for that's not in the novice band but it turned out that the third harmonic of this 7035 worked out to 21.105, which was in the novice 15 meter band and the 40 meter dipole that I had, voila, it worked straight away on 15 meters as well. So I was on 40 and 15 meters, but it took me the better part of my novice year to figure that out. You know, I wasn't quite as sharp back then as I am now, you know what I'm saying? Or maybe I was just sharp, or I just didn't know it. But that is a basic variable frequency oscillator, and you can adjust the frequency this way. Now, one of the problems that this old Knight VFO had was that it had a tendency to drift with time. Uh, and I guess it must have been a thermal-related thing. And I suppose this one would do something along the same lines. You might use a toroidal coil right here and get away from some body capacitance effects. Close the thing in a good metal enclosure. But that would be a starting point for the design of a VFO. And I was very surprised, as I said, to learn that the thing had this series resonant circuit. I was expecting some kind of a parallel resonant or tank circuit. But I realized then that with this VFO, um, I could plug the output of this VFO, the old night kit, right into the crystal socket of the Viking adventurer, and it would work. 
I couldn't key the VFO directly for some reason. I remember that. I had to have a switch that I switched that thing continuously on when I was transmitting. And then I keyed the Viking Adventurer transmitter just as if I was using a crystal. I, I had a back wave, but it wasn't strong enough to get over the air. So that's the story from here. Stan Jibalisco, W1GV, the call sign I got in 1977 when I was an operator at W1AW in Newington, Connecticut. But for now, I'll just say so long from the Black Hills of South Dakota, United States of America.